Want to patent your invention? The chance is near. You've given it heart. Now get it in gear. It's Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. Welcome to Passage to Profit. I'm Richard Gearhart, founder of Gearhart Law, a full-service intellectual property law firm. And I am Elizabeth Gearhart. I'm not a lawyer, but I work in a law firm. <laughs> and uh, if you have a question about intellectual property, patents, trademarks, copyrights, trade secrets, anything, litigation, strategy. I love it when you say that stuff. <laughs> Richard, Richard is the man you want to call. All near and dear to my heart. Yeah, I'm, uh, I love so, intellectual property. and I've been passionate about it for, for many, many years, and I'm thrilled to be here to talk with new businesses about their intellectual property and about their stories. So we are at the Gearhart Law Conference Room. The employees still have not come back. We are doing this under quarantine. Yay, COVID. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so let's jump into it. IP in the news, Richard. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about trademarks. So we usually talk about trademarks, patents, and copyrights. Remember, for our listeners who are less familiar with those topics, trademarks protect brands, patents protect ideas and inventions, and copyrights protect original works of expression like music and books and movies and all those sorts of things. But a new trend is emerging in the intellectual property world and in the celebrity world. Celebrities are getting more and more trademarks. They're trademarking their names and they're trademarking different pieces of work, their artwork, their trademarking, the titles of movies and songs. It's really pretty interesting because for a long time in the artistic community, it was considered sort of too commercial to actually file for a trademark at the trademark office. It was considered a step down from their artistic integrity. But the facts of modern life are such that now trademarks are certainly part of the commercialization of the artist's product and they protect them. And there are even some celebrities who are trademarking the names of their kids. So it's really turned out to be quite a phenomenon now, and it uh, just shows how the law is, is adapting. We looked up this article by Daniel Grant. It was online, and it was called The Art of the Deal, Why More Artists Are Getting Trademarks. And he starts out with Bob Timberlake, not Justin Timberlake's father, <laughs> an 83-year-old <laughs> artist in Lexington, North Carolina. And he has a range of products, and he trademarked his name a long time ago, and he has had people challenge his trademark, and he has won because he has kept his brand strong by using the trademark. And he filed early, and he can show that he uses it, he uses it in these categories, and the people that have challenged him have lost in court. Absolutely. And we have a special guest with us today, Kenya Gibson from iHeart Media. Welcome. Hi, guys. How are you doing? Do you think iHeart is trademarked? <laughs> oh, I'm pretty sure we are. <laughs> So it's funny, I have a little story and we have a couple minutes about the whole iHeart thing. So there was a time where iHeart, before it was iHeart, we were Clear Channel back in the day, that we didn't want to be called iHeart. Isn't that so funny? The um, CEO at the time uh, didn't like the whole iHeart like name thing and then um, realized that we there was something to be said about this little app that we created called the iHeart Radio app. And then, you know, lo and behold, here we are today with iHeart Media. So it's pretty interesting how that was once a bad idea that has turned into a very good one for us throughout all these years. Yes. Absolutely. And you're also a guest on a uh, regular guest on Wayno's podcast. Is that right? Yeah, actually, it's so so. It's funny because we we Wayno's podcast is is going to be launching. We hope September. Um, but we've been doing this show called Free Throws, and basically, Free Throws is a mentorship platform where we've been bringing on mentors from all different types of walk of life. So we've had music mentors, we've had some uh, celebrities that have come on to give advice. We've had some sports figures come on and give advice. So basically. Anybody can come on and have the opportunity to ask their favorite music artist or favorite sports player advice about how to be successful in life. And we actually, we've been building this during quarantine and it's, it's been doing really well, thank God. So yeah, another thing to be working on. <laughs> we've done a little bit of investigative work 
around a few trademark issues for that too. And so uh, having Kenya involved in as a regular on Passage to Profit, I think her trademark awareness maybe has gone up a little bit. <laughs> And so um, we're being extra cautious, you know, with the podcast. So yeah, for sure, for sure. You've been definitely been helping us in that space and we appreciate it. I mean, I think the biggest thing that I've learned through all of this is you can be on a really big platform, but if you don't have ownership of what you're creating, none of that really means much at the end of the day. So um, we're all about creativity, but we're also all about owning that intellectual property. That's and you've been able to help us with that. So we appreciate it. Our complete and total pleasure. And the bigger you get, the more people want to ride your coattails. And that's an important uh, consideration as your business or your service is growing. You want to protect your brand. Uh, so very, very important to consider trademark issues. And you want to make sure that somebody else doesn't already have a similar trademark that could block you from moving forward too. And you don't want to invest years of branding and advertising and expenditures and then only to find out somebody in California has been using the name, the same name for a similar product and they find out about you and now you've got a big legal problem. So if you are starting a business doing a trademark early, at least doing a trademark search and then filing for that federal trademark protection as soon as you can, is really important. It's not that expensive and it's definitely worth the investment to protect your brand and your company's reputation. And you need to call Gearheart Law to do that. Why would you not? By all means, give us a shout and we'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Do you want to talk just very briefly now about the Chinese and trademarks? So people think that China just rips off everything willy-nilly, but that's not true. And you can get your trademark that you have on your goods in the United States, in China as well. So if you have your trademark in China, you actually do get protection in China. The Chinese don't just steal everything like people think. Intellectual property works maybe not to exactly the same degree it works in the United States, but it's getting better every day in China. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. It used to be when you filed a trademark lawsuit in China that you uh, were limited to very minor damages. And so it was hardly even worth doing that. But the Chinese law changed a couple of years ago. And you can get substantial damages for trademark infringement now. And the cost of filing IP in China, both patents and trademarks, is still pretty low. It's roughly a third of what you would pay for that protection in the U.S. So while enforcement of intellectual property in China is still difficult. Uh, you know, culturally, they're not used to the idea of, and the, the Chinese economy is not built on innovation. It's built on borrowing other ideas. So they don't have strong intellectual property laws yet, but it, they have gradually been improving over the years. And trademarks is one area where you can still get pretty good value for the investment there. So it's not expensive and it's if you're going to be making something in China or selling it there, definitely consider Chinese trademarks. So without further ado, we have four amazing people on here today to talk about their companies. As we said, we are always pushing the limits of technology, pushing towards the future. The companies of tomorrow are here on Passage to Profit today. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so right. without further ado. Um, we'd like to introduce Mark Alterman from MA33 Strategies. And we'll be talking with him about his successes in creating a manufacturing business over $25 million dollars. But we have to stop for a break first, and we'll be right back. You're listening to Passage to Profit on WOR 710, the voice of New York. We'll be right back with Mark after this message. There's never been a better time to start your own business. The opportunities are infinite and only limited by your imagination and enthusiasm. At Gearheart Law, we believe the most successful companies all have one thing in common. They start with a solid foundation first. Gearheart Law has years of experience protecting entrepreneurs, ideas, and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at www.gearheartlaw.com. Our professionals will create a custom strategy designed to fit your needs and your budget. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection, licensed, and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't Start your project without calling us first. Visit GearheartLaw.com. Together,
together, we can change the world. Visit G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W dot com. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Now back to Passage to Profit. Once again, Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. We're here with Mark Alterman. Mark, great to have you on the show. Thanks for coming. Well, thanks, Richard. Thanks, Elizabeth. It's a real pleasure to be here with you today to... uh, discuss a a variety of issues. But first, I I have to say, Richard, I really enjoyed your comment about trademarking uh, celebrity names, because I remember uh, hearing about a story a long time ago with uh, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Bloomingdale, who had a little general store up in New England somewhere. I can't remember whether it was Vermont or perhaps New Hampshire. And he was just going along, running his little business successfully for many years, And suddenly he received a letter from Mr. Bloomingdale in New York City. (laughs) And they took exception to Mr. Bloomingdale calling his store Bloomingdale's. And uh, unfortunately, the little Mr. Bloomingdale, I think, lost that case. So uh, I can't say whether he had uh, trademarked his name before or after, but I just felt sorry for the guy because it really was his name and he should have been able to hang it on the outside of his building. You know, there there's certainly uh, a great argument for that, that people should be able to use their own name in business. But when you come up against the big chains, the big stores with a lot of money, it can be tough to defend. Sure. Trademarks are really all about first use. Whoever uses the, the, the word first is the one that has the superior rights. Again, I just want to say thank you to you for asking me to join the show today. I know that at the Gearheart firm, you're really passionate about helping people build their businesses. And uh, it's a passion that I share. I work to help businesses grow and and really find their path to sustainable profits. Uh, At my current company, MA33 Strategies, I work with entrepreneurs and executives to help them develop and implement strategies to move their companies forward. Now, I know you work with many inventors and startup companies, and those folks are really creative and they have wonderful ideas, and I'm sure they can tell you all about them, as I'm sure we're going to hear from Shari and Natalia and Ben later, uh, later in the program today. But really what they may not always do is understand how to move their business forward. And that's where I come into play and and try to help companies develop the confidence in the direction that they're going so they can grow, build their companies and sustain their profitability well into the future. Um, So that's a great point. What percentage of entrepreneurs come to you wanting help who really haven't thought through the execution side of the business? Maybe they have a great idea but they just don't really have a complete business plan or don't, don't really understand everything that needs to be done to move forward. It really varies, Richard. Uh, I, I think you do see a number of people who have a good idea and you never hear from them again, quite honestly. They, they, they don't really have a plan in place. They have an idea, but that's really all they have. And what they lack is kind of confidence in order to move forward with a plan. They don't have a business model. They may not have a startup plan. They may not have financing. But this can also be true for companies that are a little bit further along in the process who may have started and reached a certain stage but just don't know how to move past that stage. I think the key to running a successful company and really the the key to really any endeavor that we're going to take on in life is having a plan. Over the years, I I managed several companies uh, culminating in nearly 20 years with a mid-sized manufacturing and distribution company. Uh, As you said, we had sales of pretty close to $25 million. We had about 115 employees at one point. And the key was really, really having a plan. Uh, I I was the, the president and CEO of that company for many years. And uh, I learned a lot of lessons. And and honestly, I learned some of them the hard way. Uh, I earned a few of the white hairs that are in my head now, and and hopefully a little wisdom that that went along with that. But I I learned to get a good night's sleep. And the way to get a good night's sleep is to have a plan and to execute your plan. So can I ask you then, Mark, it's kind of hard to have a plan right now for a lot of people because we are in the middle of the COVID epidemic. So what strategies do you advise for small to medium-sized companies to employ right now? And what can they put in their planning right now to stay successful? I think, Elizabeth, that what we all need to recognize is that planning is really a process. And it's appropriate at any time for any business. Certainly, uh, as, as we're faced with the current COVID crisis, it's 
uh, more urgent in some respects, but there's never a wrong time to do a strategic plan. And that's true with respect to the stage of a business that you're at, whether you're a startup, whether you're midlife, whether you're a mature business in a mature industry, it's always important to have a plan. Now, I think what, what companies need to do is do an assessment. And the strategic planning process is really a three-part uh, undertaking that, that companies should go through. And I try to work with clients in, in, in exactly this way. The first thing, as I said, you need to do an assessment. That assessment looks both internally and externally your business. You have to internally assess what your strengths and weaknesses are, and you have to look outside to know what your opportunities and threats are. And that's a process that takes a lot of time and effort. Uh, normally, I would interview key stakeholders in the company to extract that information and prepare what most people know as a SWOT analysis, which is, as I said, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Before I get to the other steps in the process, as it relates to COVID, as the world has pretty much changed radically in just the last three or four months, there's nothing more important that a company can do now than take a step back, assess its situation, what their position is, what's their SWAT now. Even if they did it three months ago, nothing is the same as it was then. That's the first step. Yeah, I think when you and I spoke before too, one important thing you mentioned was to really understand and take advantage of the new technologies because they're probably not going away. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, those are opportunities that are out there in terms of technology. And I, I, I'm sure Ben can speak to these perhaps a little bit later. There are many technologies such as the ones we're using here. Yeah, you know, when we're talking about COVID, Mark, one thing I think is that you have to try to understand your market and who your target audience is. And then you have to understand how much are they affected by COVID and how are the restrictions and the sheltering in place and the, the, you know, the gradual reopening, uh, how much of that is really directly uh, affecting your business? Because if you have a restaurant, obviously the restrictions are going to have a much different effect than maybe if you're an accountant or you're in a service business where the way you interact with clients really hasn't changed that much. So I think a first step for people who are trying to do this planning is making sure that they really understand who their markets are, who their customers are, and then assessing, well, what kind of impact is the current environment going to have? Those are all great points, Richard. And it points out this, strategic planning is really a process. There's no one strategy or, or no one plan that's going to be suitable for all businesses. Really, as I said, it, it, it's a process. And the outward assessment and analysis is, is really just the first step in the process that has to take place. There are other follow-on things, but clearly in this circumstance, it's, it's critical to move forward with that assessment because we're in a very fluid environment. And maybe that's something you need to do on a, well, it's certainly something you need to do on a regular basis for any business at any time. It's all the more urgent in the current environment to look at these things as quickly and as frequently as need be. Uh, uh, as you know, the rules are changing every week in terms of what people are allowed to do. Great advice, Mark. And you're listening to Passage to Profit. Our special guest this evening is Mark Alterman. And we'll be right back after this message. What are entrepreneurs' most valuable assets? Their passion and ideas. We can't protect your passion, but we can protect your ideas. Trust Gearheart Law to protect your ideas with premier patent, trademark, and copyright services. There's never been a better time to start your own business. Contact us at GearheartLaw.com. At Gearheart Law, we have years of experience protecting entrepreneurs' ideas and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at Gearheart Law, www.gearheartlaw.com. Don't let the wrong protection strategy ruin your business. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection and are licensed and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Contact Gearheart Law on the web at G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W.com. Together, we can change the world. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. 
Passage to Profit continues with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. Now we have an executive spotlight, Ben Jomek. He is an AI specialist, so What's artificial that? intelligence. So he's like, you know, your super duper tech guy, which is very cool. He's a Can f- I get some of that? <laughs> he's a <laughs> Forbes 30 under 30 recognized entrepreneur in the AI product development space. So welcome, Ben. We are all just thrilled to meet you and to hear about AI in, in explained in normal terms. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's one of the things we try and focus on in our company. Uh, at Actuate, we build AI that can turn any camera into a smart camera. And if you've been paying attention to the news, there's been a lot of controversy in this space, especially around facial recognition. And so in a nutshell, what we try and do is build technology that can provide the best safety and security to any organization, detecting things like guns, intruders, social distancing violations, and loitering, but without identifying specific individuals or identifying faces so that we can respect privacy and reduce bias while delivering the best AI-powered security to any organization. We generally work with education and corporate customers and are just spinning up a few projects with the Department of Defense as well. That's great. So how does it kind of work? You have a camera and then you have somebody looking at a camera or are they monitoring the output from the camera? Is it all being recorded? How does the system work? Yeah, so we connect with all of the hardware that our customers already have. So something like 95% of large companies and schools have hundreds of cameras deployed and we don't want to displace that. We connect to those cameras and then we pipe that through our own software. Because if you see right now, what you described is actually pretty common. Uh, Companies will have two or three hourly employees watching security camera feeds. But we find that those two to three people are often trying to manage two to 800 cameras in total. It's just not possible for a human to watch more than, say, two or three screens at any given time. And so what our technology does is we watch them for them. And whenever we identify something of interest, such as a gun, social distancing violation, people where they're not supposed to be, crowds above a certain number of people in a given location, we then send that to the customer's security team so that they only evaluate the footage that has a risk in it and only spend their time on high value activities versus sitting there looking at a ton of screens and frankly getting really bored. (laughs) So what happens if say in elementary school, the AI picks up somebody right at the doors and it looks like they have a gun. The number one thing that we have a conversation with about with our education customers is that we are not the first investment that you make. Realistically, we're the third investment that you make in security. First, you have to have cameras. Luckily, I think 89% of elementary schools across the country do. So that box is checked. But number two is that you already need to have plans in place. You need to have active shooter plans. You need to have overall lockdown plans because our technology doesn't solve the problem. We don't magically remove the weapon. What we do is we allow you to activate those active shooter plans within five seconds instead of the five to 15 minutes it takes organizations today. That directly saves lives and results in people getting apprehended faster. So what motivated you to get into this line of work? Both me and my co-founder, Sunny Tai, come from a background of public service. Uh, Sonny actually left South Africa where he grew up because of the gun violence there and then was a U.S. Marine captain for almost 10 years. So he's always wanted to do something about the gun violence problem in society. As for myself, while I haven't served, both my parents are U.S. government officers and I grew up overseas under Marine protection. So the idea of using technology to make organizations safer deeply connected with my background. And that was only increased after I spent a number of years at Microsoft leading a team of data scientists and engineers. And Sonny was actually the person who came up with the idea. And when he came to me with the concept of using technology to make organizations safer, that just connected. And we've been working on it ever since. In layman's terms, how does your software do this compared to other software? What kind of analysis is performed by the computer? And do the computers that do this have to be like really big and powerful? So they do, they have to be extremely big and powerful. And so our service is actually, it's a service. It's not a piece of software or a piece of hardware. So we connect to the cameras over the internet and run it on our own servers, which allows us to deliver this extremely cheaply, even though the hardware that you need to do the processing is really, really expensive. And in terms of the technical side of things, I mean, there's a lot of technical mumbo jumbo here, which I won't get into, but in a nutshell, what differentiates the type of technology that we use now, which is called deep learning and has really been developed only over the past few years and traditional methods is that we teach the computer what a gun looks like. 
and it's looking at camera feeds like a human would, looking for the contours of a weapon. Whereas traditionally, you could only really say, oh, there's an object about this size that's moving at about this speed, which is really, really inaccurate. And kind of connecting back to your key interest, uh, we've actually protected most of this through trade secrets. And while we have significant trademarks that we're currently in discussions about expanding. I think software patents are a little bit more controversial than patents are in a lot of other spaces. So we've decided to avoid the method patent approach and our system is completely proprietary and held a secret. I was looking at Ben's website for the company and what I noticed, Ben, and you mentioned it in your introduction regarding monitoring social distancing. Three months ago, none of us knew anything about social distancing or, or very little. And I was just curious, how are you guys prepared to pivot so quickly to address that need? One of the big things is, I think, as you said yourself, Mark, uh, especially in these turbulent environments, companies constantly have to reevaluate. And while we're lucky that we haven't lost customers and actually we're starting to see a ton of interest in our solution, I don't think anybody in the software space outside of video conferencing sold much of anything over the past <laughs> three months. So we spent that time really looking at our technology and seeing how we could address the problems of the day. COVID-19, racial justice, to some extent, obviously, and urban unrest with the technologies we'd already had. And what we discovered is that we had a pretty basic intruder detection system that just looks for people. We don't analyze faces. We don't know who that person is. We can tell you with virtually perfect accuracy if there's a person in this video. And so what we did was we built analysis on top of that that says, oh, how close are the people together? Where are they? How many people are there? And so we can deliver that social distancing intelligence, that crowd detection intelligence in ways that help companies and organizations manage their space without getting into the pitfalls of facial recognition and all the types of bias that are so topical these days. That's awesome. Kenya, did you have something? No, I'm just, I'm so blown away at your thought process and just the creativity of this. I, I think it's really impressive and super smart of you to just really be creating in this space um, because obviously safety is super important for us. I mean, I work in New York City, like a lot of us do. And, you know, we, we have a lot of people that come in and out of the building. I know we do regular like safety drills, but I have to tell you, I mean, we've never been approached with anything of this magnitude that has been incorporated as far as um, what our strategy would be for preventative ways to protect ourselves. So I think this, it's really phenomenal what you're doing. Oh, well, thank you so much. Uh, we're actually in discussions with a number of the most high profile sites in Manhattan. We're actually based right next to Grand Central. So that's our home ground. And over the past few weeks, we've been operating some of our technology in the Bronx and helping protect some of the more hard hit areas. So this is something we care really deeply about. And you know, if iHeartRadio is interested, we're happy to have the discussion. You've been doing this. When did you actually put maybe your first installation, hook up to the first camera somewhere with this AI software. So we've been in business for just over two years. And I would say that we first connected with one of our pilot customers, who's still one of our top customers, a school in urban Chicago, about two years ago. And okay. since then, we've been focused on building out the core detection capabilities. And just this year, we've seen the business really take off. And what is your marketing plan? I think like a lot of startups, we are a direct sales focused business, but the security industry heavily works through resellers. And over the past few months, one of the other things that we've been doing during the COVID-19 pause is reaching out to our reseller networks, really developing those relationships. And going forward, we see that as one of the core areas of our business. Directly, we will go to high profile sites and the US government and our resellers will focus on international markets and smaller deployments for us. It was great that you guys were able to take the step back and hit the pause button and take the time to rethink and look at your opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I definitely can tell you that my sales team was not super happy the past few months, but for all the rest of us, especially on the technology side, we really enjoyed the experience of being able to step back and do something that we really felt made our offering a lot more complete and appealing to a larger swath of the market versus the real threat gun detection focus that we'd had before. So I completely agree with everything you said, Mark. So this has been Ben Shomack with Actuate.ai. And just a fascinating company. And we have to go to break now. So you are listening to Passage to Profit, the inventor show on WOR 710. Hi, I'm Lisa Askley, the inventress, founder, CEO, and president of Inventing A to Z. I've been inventing products for over 38 years, hundreds of products later and dozens of patents. I help people develop products and put them on the market from concept to fruition. I bring them to some of the top shopping networks in the world, QVC, 
HSN, Evine Live, and retail stores. Have you ever said to yourself, someone should invent that thing? Well, I say, why not make it you? If you want to know how to develop a product from concept to fruition the right way, contact me, Lisa Askeles, the inventress. Go to inventingatoz.com, inventingatoz.com. Email me, lisa at inventingatoz.com. Treat yourself to a day chock full of networking, education, music, shopping, and fun. Go to my website, inventingatoz.com. Now back to Passage to Profit. Once again, Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. Our next presenter this evening is Natalie Barr from Empowered Cookies, and she's going to be talking about one of my absolutely favorite subjects. So welcome to the show. Tell us what you're doing. Thank you. Definitely not in tech. We're in food over here. So the Empowered Cookie is a plant-based and gluten-free and grain-free cookie. And when most people hear that, they take a step back. They're like, oh, it must taste like cardboard. But our actual motto is that life is too short to eat cardboard. You should be able to eat food that is delicious for you and that you absolutely love. And so we're here to empower consumers to eat food that they look forward to and they feel nourishes their bodies. And we have six flavors of cookies that are sold single serving and they're on everywhere on e-commerce such as Amazon and QVC on off of our website and a variety of other retailers. Thank goodness for that in COVID times. Um, but we're based in Oakland in the Bay Area, and so which is where I'm born and raised and started the company out here. And we sell in yoga studios and natural food stores and coffee shops and gyms and um, anywhere where people want to grab a healthy snack that's delicious. So what's your best seller flavor-wise? The double chocolate chunk. Of what course. a shock. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, we have, so our tribe consumer are people who live with food allergies. And so being able to reunite them with, oh my gosh, I can have dessert again is what brings us most joy. And so we have these thick chocolate cookies, the double chocolate chunk that tastes like a brownie. They have huge chunks of melty chocolate in them. And then the two other chocolate flavors are chocolate cherry and then chocolate walnut. And um, amazingly, there's people who can't have chocolate, these poor souls. And so we have three flavors that are for them. And there's ginger molasses and lemon lavender poppy seed, which is really popular, which is very like Sonoma County wine country vibe. And then raisin walnut, which is like the, the classic cookie you grew up with. So try to please everybody. So how many calories per cookie? <laughs> Um, well, so we use almond meal and flax meal instead of flour. So the calories are like in the 230 for a big fat three ounce cookie. So it's like a breakfast cookie. It's the perfect thing to grab with coffee on your way out to work. Not that anybody's going and doing that nowadays, but it's the perfect thing to have before or after a workout. We sell it CrossFit gyms. It's, it's really something that, you know, a mom can have when she's on her way home from a workout and wants to split it with her kid and feel good about the snack that she's sharing with them. And we cater to people who want to eat like a low inflammation diet. And so that means no grains. So the almond meal gives you your protein, gives you the soft, chewy, it keeps the cookies really moist. And you got to have that word. If a cookie is not moist, it's a cracker to us. And so it's really got to be something you look forward to. And that's the whole point. You know, living with food allergies is hard enough and you don't want to insult people with some dry stale loser cookie that they're like great this is i already feel limited and this is overly priced overly sweet and really dry so <laughs> that's what we strive to move away from that's true because a lot of people think of vegan food or like non-allergy food as cardboard <laughs> it's like rice cakes remember the plain rice cakes that are like eating styrofoam oh that's God, what people think of. but have your sales been affected then by covid i take it you're in retail uh hard retail stores absolutely we we already wanted to build an e-commerce business because that's where actual profits exist because selling in retail, the margins are so low and the food industry margins are already so low. So COVID just helped us slam on the e-commerce gas because more people are shopping online because they have to. More of us have had to set our parents up with grocery delivery because we don't want them leaving the house and, you know, 
being able to serve people nationwide because a lot of people live in a food desert, you know, where there's not a natural food store near you and you're like, great, I'm over here living with a food allergy or my child does, or we're just sitting on our butts all day trying to eat healthy and they don't know where to find this food. And so we do sell nationwide, but our sales, our retail sales are tragic because the best places we sell at are closed for the foreseeable future. You know, gyms and coffee shops and places like that that do better than, than grocery stores for us. And that's really where our consumer hangs out is she's getting her workout, she's grabbing coffee, she's grabbing lunch. And so we're having to reinvent uh, where we sell and how we intersect our customer. That's great. And again, uh, just like Ben, I see that you've taken the time and, and really had the necessity of, of trying to redirect your business a little bit over the last several months. I'm just curious curious, do you have specific goals and specific metrics and, and how are you measuring the success of your efforts? We measure it through growth. Uh, I want to see e-commerce month over month growth. Retail is, you know, the ugly stepchild right now. So I really am not looking at those metrics, but we are growing on Amazon with organic um, traffic, but we've just invested in who I consider an Amazon wizard to help in the back end and really like drive us to the top. Because when you type in gluten-free cookie right now, we're pages deep. And so the way that we measure growth is by being able to see we are acquiring new customers. Our email list is growing. We have a high return rate on the website. We have a low bounce rate. We have like people spending more money on the website on cookies. You know, we have people spending over $200 on a cookie order um, in stock up mode, which is great. It's great to see people in Nebraska reaching for healthy, you know, cookies. I'm happy to see the world moving in that direction. And I think that if you sell online right now and you're not seeing growth, you should be worried. Like I would be really worried if my business wasn't seeing e-commerce growth. And we did launch on QVC this year. And so that's not exactly an avenue I expected cookies to go wild on. It's more of like selling blow dryers and vacuums and stuff is what I consider when I hear QVC. But it's been an incredible growth partner for us and and me really opening up to how many consumers across the country want this type of food but don't know where to find it and they want a trusted resource to find it through. So just being creative with like thinking in the mind in the footsteps of our consumer where she is and trying to meet her there. And QVC has been a great partner for us in that way. Hey, I am she, I am your consumer. Uh, <laughs> I'm actually, I'm a fitness trainer in New York city now more so virtually. I've been doing all my classes online and I am like that girl, right? So I'm the one I, I love sweets. I love cookies. I know I can't eat regular cookies. So this is perfect for me because it seems so healthy. And, and it's like, I'm like on the go and always running. So it's like perfect for me to like pop a cookie before a workout or after a workout to recover. One of the things that I saw on your website that I really, really liked that you said is you are helping to improve America's food system. And I think that is so key because I feel like we live in a very great country, but we have just such a crappy system of food that has been so problematic for us. Um, and it's, it's really disturbing. So I, I love to see brands and products that are coming to the table to really create solutions in that space because food is really 80% of everything that we are. And then I tell people like the workout piece is the other 20%. So I'm happy to see you're creating something in that space. There were, it's funny when you were talking about, there are some other brands on the market that are, you know, trying to do what you're doing, but they're not really doing it as well. I'm not going to mention a name, (laughs) but I loved this one cookie forever and ever and ever. And then I noticed I was experiencing some inflammation. And it, and it was like affecting me. And I definitely feel like I have some sort of food allergy that I probably need to get like diagnosed, but thinking because on the package, it said that it's, you know, it's this, it's that, it's this and that. And then the ingredients aren't really matching up with what is being marketed is very problematic, I think, in the health food space. So I'm happy to see that there's actually a solution in the market that super serves the cookie base also is real in what it says it delivers. Cause I, you know, I have had problems with other brands that claim that's what they do. And then my body reacts differently to what's on the label. How do we find your cookies? You can go to empoweredcookie.com. 
and that's where you can buy them. If you just want to check us out, see our flavors and our branding, you can go to empowered.cookie on Instagram and check us out there. You can go find us on QVC if you're a QVC shopper. Your packaging is great, by the way. Like, you're very well branded, and it, it seems like you definitely am off to a phenomenal start. Consumers should see that their grocery cart is an incredible vehicle for change social change, environmental change, and people are waking up more now to the racial change that we can impart with understanding how, you know, the farmers that grow our food need to get paid equal wages and food is just inherently political. And it also can be such a way to, you know, have a part of your day where you, you feel like you belong um, to a community. And so the Empowered Cookie is interpreted by consumers in a way that makes them feel, you know, they can and do make a difference. Every time you put your fork to your mouth and put a product in your cart, you're shaping the food system. So that is a great message. Uh, it's been a delicious segment. <laughs> Natalie, Say thanks that. for coming. And um, he wants I remember- $200 worth now. <laughs> I want $200 worth of cookies because uh, great to have you on and we look forward to your business growing and taking off, uh, helping the food chain and we hope you do all sorts of wonderful things. So you're listening to Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gerhart. We'll be right back with our third and final presenter after this message. There's never been a better time to start your own business. The opportunities are infinite and only limited by your imagination and enthusiasm. At Gearheart Law, we believe the most successful companies all have one thing in common. They start with a solid foundation first. Gearheart Law has years of experience protecting entrepreneurs, ideas, and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at www.gearheartlaw.com. Our professionals will create a custom strategy designed to fit your needs and your budget. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection, licensed and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Visit gearheartlaw.com. Together, we can change the world. Visit G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W.com. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Passage to Profit continues with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. If you're just tuning in, you've missed some amazing presenters. It's just like a really incredible show. We always get such different things. I'm and hungry. I know. Our last one was cookies. But we have a really cool one coming up now, too. Sherry Hammond has Inspired Product Development Company. And I went on your website, Sherry, and your products are like amazing. So tell us all about it. Oh, thank you very much. And thanks for having me. Inspired Product Development Group is just that. We develop products. I'm in business with my father. We're a father-daughter inventing entrepreneurial duo. And we develop products for the home that solve problems and inspire you to get organized and tackle those DIY projects on your own. Great. So tell, give us some examples of some of the products that you've worked with. So Inspired Product Development Group was actually started in 2017, and we have two products currently on the market. Our goal is to develop and launch one product every year. It's a pretty aggressive goal. The first product we did is called the Cabinet Caddy, and it's an organizational caddy for your kitchen cabinets, and it adds a layer of vertical storage in there. So when you've got a tight space like your kitchen cabinets, your spices, you know, I'm five foot four, and so getting in my spice cabinet and reaching back to get that, you know, small little cinnamon spice, and I would knock everything down, and, you know, a glass bottle fell on my toe, and I said a few explicatives, but this cabinet caddy has two shelves, and you pull out and rotate, and it actually presents your spices to you, and it's a way to not organize the large, you know, wholesale club spices. Those you can find. It's the little ones and stuff that you lose back in the corners, so this actually is great for spices, prescriptions, supplements, anything that you have a lot of and that you'd like to organize. Well, that sounds great. It sounds like a safer alternative to getting up on the step stool and reaching in the wrong spot. So how did the idea come to you? Was it your idea or did you work with somebody else who had the idea first? How did that evolve? Again, this 
problem solving, we try to build a better mousetrap. I had this horrible issue with my height and trying to organize my spices. And I, I have a picture before and after on my website and it's absolutely ridiculous. Um, so our method of developing products is understanding the space. Who are you trying to market to? When there's a problem, you go out there and you see what's out there. So yes, there are some products out there that will move, you know, in cabinets and these wire racks that will pull and roll out and kind of bring these to you. We wanted something that would rotate around, really take advantage of that vertical space and add another layer of storage in your kitchen cabinet and it rotates around and presents those items to you. Really interesting. And, and uh, I, I looked at your website last night and showed it to my wife and, and probably be seeing an order from us pretty soon. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. So it was worth coming on the show today. But really, uh, my, my question for you, Sherry, is in this world of, of COVID that we're in now, how's your supply chain? And are, are you able to maintain that? Have you had to consider looking at alternate vendors for things that, uh, that, that you're purchasing? Well, we have a wonderful relationship with our manufacturer who bases out of Hong Kong, but obviously manufactures in China. And it's all about communication. We just before COVID, we had an order, we're going to do a QVC launch for the cabinet caddy. And QVC had ordered all their product and COVID hit in China three right. weeks, four weeks earlier than it did for us. And so their factories completely shut down and we were scrambling and trying to figure out what we we're going to do. Of course, everybody has been so understanding and giving grace and and everything throughout this whole process um, but really communication is the key and we ended up being on track getting everything on schedule and where we were able to get the product out the door reordering and placing new orders has been uh, a bit of a challenge the cabinet caddy is pretty much sold out because of covid um, our amazon sales went through the roof our own website sales increased as well and as a result we're out of the cabinet caddy however qvc has some and, and that launch is coming up so we're pretty excited about that you have other products on your website as well right you and your father are you're like the inventors right so what is that our newest product is called Go Hang It. It's a picture hanging and leveling tool that comes with 85 pieces of picture hanging hardware in the kit. And this little level pops off. You can set it on top of your frame, get it all level, and um, mark your nail holes. The cool thing about this product is that, you know, the problem is that when you get a frame, sometimes the hardware won't be mounted properly on the back or you put it on yourself and it's a little bit askew. And so when you go to hang it on the wall, you have no way, because it's to the back and you can't see it, no way to identify exactly where those nails or screws need to go on the wall. Well, we've solved that problem. So again, I'm a, I'm a single mom. I have a 12-year-old son. I wanted to hang this collage of his awards and sports pictures and stuff like that. And by the time I, I hung three pictures, I was about to pull my hair out and I had about 30 holes in the wall. And I said, there has to be a better way. So wow. we've developed this unique system of identifying, um, we have these little magnetic keys. I don't know if you can see these, they're teeny tiny, there they are. These little magnetic keys and they fit in the back of your sawtooth hanger. So it goes just like that. And that has a positioning point. And when you put it on the wall, and you push, it marks your nail holes. It's a very simple concept, um, but it works like a charm. And it's our newest product. We just got our container in in February, and things are picking up and, and looking pretty good. So you're able to ship that now? Yes, absolutely. What are your plans? Are, are you going to try to maybe then just sell everything through Amazon, through your website? What are your plans going forward? Do you have a strategy? Well, you know, COVID really pulled the rug out underneath us just before the International Housewares show, and that was canceled. I had my flights. We were, we were going. We had this new booth designed, and we were on the Shark Tank aisle and had it teed up. We had meetings set, and it was going to be, like, super exciting. I felt like it was the, the, the launch of our company and yanked the rug right under us, didn't they? I thought, you know, when this first happened that, that this was going to be a super, super challenging for us to to continue sales and, and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, people just started shopping online and that opened up doors for us that we couldn't have even imagined. We have been so blessed through this whole process. Yes, we're waiting on a container of the cabinet caddy to get in and, and there are some delays there, 
but you know all all is well and we have a second product that go hang it and uh, next year we're working on a cabinet caddy gen 2 so we're always trying to better ourselves and really continue to solve those problems and create things for the home that solve problems for you and that you will absolutely love. Well, thank you. You're listening to Passage to Profit, the Inventor Show on WR710. We will be right back. What are entrepreneurs' most valuable assets? Their passion and ideas. We can't protect your passion, but we can protect your ideas. Trust Gearheart Law to protect your ideas with premier patent, trademark, and copyright services. There's never been a better time to start your own business. Contact us at GearheartLaw.com. At Gearheart Law, we have years of experience protecting protecting entrepreneurs' ideas and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at Gearheart Law, www.gearheartlaw.com. Don't let the wrong protection strategy ruin your business. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection and are licensed and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Contact Gearheart Law on the web at G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W dot com. Together, we can change the world. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Now more with Richard and Elizabeth. Passage to Profit. Such a great show this evening. I just want to ask Elizabeth, what's going on with Fireside? Fireside, as I mentioned before, I was videotaping people for a video directory of small to medium business. And I was doing it in our studio in Summit. And when COVID hit, I pivoted to Zoom, which is actually kind of easier because people are used to using Zoom. So I'm trying to build the site right now. So I'm just trying to get as many people on there as I can. And I have all different types of businesses, which is fine. If I can really grow it how I want to, I'll split it up later. I'm getting really great businesses on here. And as soon as I get about 50, then I'm going to start on the other side of the business and start trying to drive people to the site, to the YouTube channel and to the site. But I'm getting activity now. And I joined a chamber and gave a presentation there and I'm getting people from the chamber. And people enjoy doing these short Zoom videos and they have a place to put them. People actually tell me they like watching people's (laughs) videos. It's like a mini passage to profit with just me and the other person. But my vision is that this will be like the video Wikipedia of small business. That sounds great. And thanks for the update. Why don't we wrap up a little bit and let our audience know where they can find information about our guests and our presenters. Absolutely. So Mark Alterman was our guest and he strategizes for small and medium sized companies and it's ma33strategies.com. We had Kenya Gibson here from iHeartMedia. So you can go to iHeartMedia and look up Kenya Gibson. She's Kenya Gibson at iHeartMedia.com. We had Ben Jomek with Actuate.ai and honestly go to his website. It's kind of higher level B2B, but if you're a mom and you want your school or if you somebody want your organization to adopt it, look at what he's got and take it to the people in charge. This is truly a technology of the future. And we had Natalia Barr with EmpoweredCookie.com. So check those out. They are really popular. They're flying off. Well, they were flying off the shelves. Now they're flying off Amazon, (laughs) flying (laughs) off the internet. And Sherry Hammond with Inspired Product Development Group. That's inspiredpdg.com. And she has products that just make everyday living easier for people, right? So they're home products, but they're like, why didn't I think of this? Listeners, the show goes on. Thank goodness for our excellent producer, Noah Fleischman, who can take these Zoom recordings and actually make them into something that can go on iHeartRadio. So tune in next week for another excellent guest and another excellent round of presenters. You never know what you're going to hear, but you can bet it's probably something you haven't heard before. (laughs) (laughs) In a positive way. In a positive way. (laughs) And don't forget, too, to like us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. This is Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt on iHeartRadio with Passage to Profit, WOR 710, the voice of New York. 